Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this video, we are going to overview chapter seven, um, specifically sampling distributions for sample means and sample proportions. So a lot of what we did in chapter six is going to come back. So there's going to be some familiar um, themes that you'll see. Um, but we also have a little bit of additional thought that we need to take into consideration when looking at problems from this chapter. So once again, I remind everyone that uh, I am pulling um, these problems and um, uh, graphics and things from our publisher, Hawks Learning Systems, uh, and the copyright information is below. So simply citing my source for where this material um, is coming from. All right, so we are going to look at an introduction to the sampling distribution, and then we're going to do some computations with probabilities for both sampling distribution for sample means and sampling distribution for sample proportions. So uh, I know that's a bit of a tongue twister, a lot to say, so we need to unpack what we mean by sampling distribution. So at the end of this chapter, you should be able to define and explain what the sampling distribution is. Um, you should be able to determine what the mean and standard deviation are for a scenario for sample means or sample proportions certainly within the context of the sampling distribution, and of course, carry out various computations uh, for probabilities involving sampling distribution for sample means and sample proportions. Lots of sample stuff floating around here. Anyway, all right, so let's try to understand what we mean by a sampling distribution. The simple definition for what a sampling distribution is, is it's the distribution of the values of a particular sample statistic for all possible samples of a given size n. So what we have to remember is from chapter one, we, we talked about taking a sample because we needed to infer about population. And you might recall that the population might just be so large and so complex that it's just impossible to really know anything about it. And so what we have to do then is to take a smaller group of individuals, a sample, do whatever we need to do with them to get the data and then try to infer about the population. So that is the idea here. Well, when we take so many samples and examine these statistics, these numerical characteristics, and we put them together, we get what's called the sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution is showing us all the different statistics coming from all the different samples that we are taking. And so what we do in this chapter is we explore this idea of taking samples from two contexts. One is with means and one is with proportions. And you might ask, well, why are we considering means and proportions? Well, means are for quantitative data and proportions are for qualitative data. Okay. So if you remember the vocabulary back again from uh, chapters one and two. And this theme of means and proportions is going to come back again um, when we look at confidence intervals as well as hypothesis tests. So this idea of means and proportions is going to be very much so related. Additionally, what we're learning here builds on last week, as I talked about a moment ago, but also will be necessary when we get to hypothesis testing. So you'll see this chapter seven material come back again. All right, so let's try to understand what we mean by a sampling distribution. So what I would encourage you to do is just simply pause this video and take a look at this particular diagram, okay? Just, just read it over and, and see if you can make some sense of this. If we look closely at this particular diagram, what you should notice is that the large circle in the top left represents the population, <laughs> okay? So we have all these dots. These dots can represent anything you want. Let's just say for the sake of this conversation, let's pretend they're test scores. And they are for statistics students, okay? So we have a population and the population mean as it reports here is 70. So somebody figured out what the what the mean exam score, let's just say it's a final exam score for all statistics students across institutions uh, in the United States. So everybody taking elementary statistics. Well, this would be thousands and thousands of, of students. So what we can do, is we can actually take samples from the population. And that actually makes sense because in order to take a sample, it has to be coming from the population anyway. So sample A could represent um, a class, a statistics class at a particular institution. And let's say that has 35 um, students, okay? And what you'll notice is that it has its own mean, okay? And that mean is 68. 
we could take sample B, it could be another sample uh, from another institution, another statistics class, and it has an average final exam score 73. And, and same thing with sample C, sample D, et cetera, and E. So this is where I'm looking at. Well, what we do is we continue taking samples from the population and we consider all the different averages that these samples produce. These are called sample statistics because statistics causes coming from the sample. And if we start to sort of count up the frequency of their occurrence, then what happens is it starts to look like a normal curve. So what will happen is a lot of the means are going to be very close to the population mean of 70. And if you look at the normal curve, 70 is in the middle. And if you see 68, 73, 73, uh, 77, okay, somewhat close, but we also have an 82, right? And that's sort of out in that right tail. So if we repeat this process of taking samples over and over again, and we keep track of these means, and we start to count the frequency that these sample means occur, what we notice is that it begins to follow, excuse me, begins to follow a normal distribution. It begins to look like a bell-shaped curve. And of course, this is in the context of means, but we could give this in the context of proportions as well. So that's the idea here. So we take these samples and we put the samples together, we get a sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution of means would be this normal distribution, us keeping track of how often they occur. But it'll, all of these statistics are coming from these various samples. So that's the idea for how this sort of works. <clears throat> Now, you'll notice that again, we had the normal distribution um, that was that was shown at least for the frequency of occurrences, and we want to be able to use the normal distribution with with the sampling distribution. But but there's there's some help that we need, and the reason is because we are using samples, and there's a lot of variation that can go with those samples, and that has to be taken in consideration, especially when we go to compute a probability. So. What we have to do then is sort of understand the relationship of the variable. And so sometimes you may see the phrase approximately normal, which will describe a particular variable. You've seen this phrase a little bit in chapter six. And I said, when you see the phrase approximately normal, that means it, it follows sort of this bell-shaped symmetric distribution. Um, we're able then to use the normal distribution tables, the z-scores, and all those sorts of things. So we, we like to be able to see that phrase. It's very helpful. Now, the tool specifically that's going to help us in this chapter is known as the central limit theorem, or the CLT. Now, there are several components to the CLT that we're going to look at in a moment. And those, those components really are going to be changes to the formulas, OK? So we'll look at those in just a second. But there's a couple of conclusions that we need to consider. The first is that in order for us to use the central limit theorem, we have to have a sample size of at least 30. And again, the reason why we need at least 30 is because samples can produce a lot of variation. So we need some stability. And so our statisticians have figured out that 30 is, a, is an appropriate sample size that sort of minimizes the variation as much as possible. Obviously, the larger the sample size, uh, the better. OK, so we're looking for at least 30. Somebody's going to ask, what happens if you have a sample size of 20? Not good enough. We cannot use then the central limit theorem. And everything we say here is is null and void. OK, so we have to look for a sample size of at least 30. Now, the other important part to this is that the shape of the sampling distribution um, of sample means or sample proportions is going to approach that of a normal distribution, okay? And what that means is that when I start to count the frequency of those sample statistics, it's going to look like a bell-shaped symmetric curve, just like we had on the previous slide, okay? That's what we mean by approaches normal distribution. Now, the key is that the larger the sample size, the better the normal distribution approximation is going to be. In other words, the more it really is going to look like a bell-shaped um, symmetric uh, uh, curve, okay, that we're used to seeing. 
And the reason that we need the sample size to be large enough is again, because we want to reduce the variation. If you remember back in chapter one, when we talked about reducing variation, you need a large sample size. Okay, so the larger the sample size, the better. So again, that's why we say at least 30. If we can get more than that, um, even better. So those are these are two important um, components of the CLT. We're going to have a few more in a few minutes that have involved changes to the formulas, but um, these are important considerations that we need to remember. Um, there is a special note about proportions. Um, we don't cover the binomial distribution in this particular class, but I would invite you to pause and read this through, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may all have uh, uh, during our class session, okay? But this, there is a note that we have to make sure um, is, is here for completion's sake uh, for proportion. So again, pause and give it a read. <clears throat> all right, so let's try to understand the context that we're going to be dealing with in Chapter 7. So we have two contexts. The first is a means, which deals with quantitative data. And I want to remind you of what the variables that, that we use represent. So at this point, you're going to have to know that when I say X bar, I'm not just talking about the mean, I'm talking about the sample mean. And if I say, excuse me, mu, um, I'm not talking about the mean, I'm talking about the population mean. So this is where we need everybody. You have to know the difference between mu and X bar, very important. Sigma um, stands for the population standard deviation. Now, on the other side of the, the fence here, we have proportions, which again, deal with qualitative data. So P would represent what we call the population proportion. So in this case, P and mu would be considered, and sigma, for that matter, sigma, mu, and P would be considered the parameters because they're representing the population. And the sample proportion, we use P hat. So that little little triangle that's uh, above the P, we call that P hat. Isn't that cute? Just the darndest little thing. Anyway, so P hat and X bar, these would be statistics because they're coming from the sample. So hopefully you remember that uh, discussion from chapter one. Parameters describe populations, statistics describe samples. So remember that proportions are decimals, fractions, and percentages. This is what they can look like for the sake of our conversation. Because what you're going to have to do when we when we get to the story problem portion of this is you're going to have to be able to tell whether or not a problem is dealing with means or it's dealing with proportions. And that can sometimes be a little bit tricky. All right, now we have some changes to the formulas, okay? And this is brought about by the central limit theorem. Now, on the left side, I hopefully you remember that notation N, and then in parentheses here, mu and sigma, that was chapter six. What happens is we undergo a change because now we're considering samples. And what you should see is we introduce a new variable, sort of. It's mu X bar. The X bar is written as a subscript. So how you read that is the mean of the sampling distribution for sample means. So what this is telling me is who are we using as the average if we're talking about a sample mean, a sampling distribution for sample means? Who is the average? And the answer is it's mu, okay? Because if you go from the second um um, set of parentheses with n to the third, you notice that it went from mu, mu x bar back to mu. So that center that we're using, that mean is going to be mu. Now, if you look carefully, we have one other change, and this is to sigma. Sigma becomes sigma x bar. What does this mean? This means the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for sample means, okay? The context, again, is now dealing with sample means. Okay, this has transformed from sigma to sigma over square root of n. Now, everybody's gonna ask, well, why? Because now we're dealing with samples. So the central limit theorem tells us we now need to take into consideration the sample size. So in order for me in chapter seven to understand what the mean is, we look at mu, straightforward enough, but to get sigma, we need to look at sigma over root n. That is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for sample means. Again, this is implication from the uh, central limit theorem. Now, as a result, we have a change to the z-score formula. So the z-score formula used to be x minus mu over sigma. That was our, our world in chapter three and chapter six, okay? Okay. 
in chapter seven, it now switches to X bar minus mu because now we're dealing with a sample mean. And look what happened again in the denominator. We went from sigma to sigma divided by the square root of 10. So there's a little bit of change then to the z-score formula, okay? So this is the easier of the two contexts because we have a little bit of familiarity with it already. Now, proportions, it gets a little interesting. Okay, here's what it looks like for proportions. And this is a bit strange. Again, we start with chapter six. We had mu and sigma, okay? And in this instance, we now have mu p hat and sigma p hat. So mu p hat means the mean of the sampling distribution of sample proportions. And everybody gets confused on this. They say, wait a second. How can you have a mean and a proportion? Okay, this, this does not make sense. We have to remember, if we are using a normal distribution, there has to be a center. And the center to the normal distribution, we always say is the mean. Because the context is proportions, I need a value to represent the center of that normal distribution. That's why we call it mu p hat. So what the value that we interpret as the center is going to be P. P, remember, was the um, uh, uh, population proportion, okay? I almost said population parameter. It's true, but population proportion. P is the proportion here okay, for, the, for the population. So again, who is the center? The center for proportions is P. So if somebody asks you, what is the mean of the sampling distribution of sample proportions? You respond P. It's a fancy way of saying, who are you taking to be in the middle? Okay, so because the context here is dealing with qualitative data with proportions, we have to take it to be P. Now, sigma of P hat, P hat, remember, is the sample proportion, is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, but this time it's for sample proportions. And it has this formula. We haven't seen this formula previously. We take the square root of P times one minus P all over N, okay? And so that way, this, this idea of the normal distribution changes from mu comma sigma to P comma square root of P times one minus P all over the square root of N. So again, we have a change to the z-score formula. In this case, we move from the chapter three, chapter six, x minus mu over sigma to p e hat minus p divided by square root of p times one minus p all over n. Lots of variables floating around here, okay? I promise we will work some examples where this will become more clear uh, in these instances. What you're looking at on this screen is just a side-by-side -side comparison um, of the formulas for means and proportions. And these are all found on your formula sheet. Um, what I just need you to make sure that you remember, number one, is you have to decide on whether or not a problem is dealing with means or proportions. And that is going to dictate which of the formulas for the z-score that you're going to have to use. All right, so here's a question. Do you all remember the four cases from chapter six? I hope so. Um, here's good news, they're back. Okay, so area left to the right in between and in the tails. Um, these are all 100% fair game here in chapter seven. Okay, so that's the good news. Um, so hopefully you have some familiarity with that from chapter six. If not, go and take a look at the chapter six video. Uh, but it's nice that we get to kind of exercise um, that familiarity um, with that. So um, how we do these problems, at least for the purposes of this video, I, I will assume you know how to deal with area left, right, in between, and in the tails, okay? But again, if you need that refresher, that's an excellent question uh, for office hours uh, as well as class or going back to the chapter six video. All right, let's try to apply some of the vocabulary that we've uh, we've looked at so far. So it says, suppose the standard deviation of movie ticket prices in the US is 72 cents. We have sample means are calculated uh, of sample size 52. So that is the ticket prices are recorded for different samples of 52 theaters and the sample means are calculated. So we want uh, to know the following. What would be the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means? And that is the standard error of the mean. <clears throat> so standard error of the mean is a fancy way of saying what's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for sample means. So first of all, the context we're dealing with is means. And I know that because it says means in the question. 
So this is the formula that we have to use. They're asking us, what is the standard deviation for this? So that's going to be sigma divided by the square root of n. So sigma, they told us, was 0.72. The sample size is 52. So this standard deviation should be about a dime. Okay. So the question sounds a bit more menacing than it really is. That's why I said this vocabulary for people can be very tricky. Just read it carefully and, and, and really get to what it's asking us here. I would invite you to pause the uh, video and read through this one and see if you can answer these questions based on the central limit theorem discussion that we had um, earlier. All right, hopefully you've had an opportunity to read through this. So what we're looking at here is a sampling distribution of sample means, and these were all for sample sizes of 45, okay? So what's happened is they've taken the weights of, of horse jockeys, okay, and sort of computed um, what the various weights would be. Um, and we've got a mean here again of 116.2. Okay, so it says for part A, can the central limit theorem be applied to the sampling distribution? If so, explain how the conditions are met. Okay, so we have to remember that for the central limit theorem to apply, we have to have um, a sample size of three. Well, we have a sample size of 45. So yes, um, that perfectly is fine to use. Part B wants to know what does the sampling distributions mean? Okay, well, since the since the context is mean, we take mu x bar to be the mean of this distribution, which is 116.2. Part C wants to know the sampling distribution standard deviation. Okay, well, to do that, we need to do the uh, sigma over square root of n. So sigma was reported to be 3.9, and the sample size again is 45. So that should be about 0.58, uh, 0.58 pounds. And part D says, what is the sampling distribution's shape? Um, well, according to the central limit theorem, its shape should mimic the normal distribution and be bell-shaped Okay, by the central limit theorem. So these are the solutions. Again, I'd encourage you to pause this um, video and read through the questions here. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to work through these. So part A is asking us to describe the distribution. So if we look at the picture that is provided, um, it looks like it's bimodal. Uh, there appear to be two peaks. Now somebody might say, well, one peak is higher than the other. We have to remember that this is raw data. Um, so it is possible that um, an argument could be made that, yeah, maybe there are two modes here, okay, in that respect. Now part B says that we wanna consider um, a sample size of 25, and can we then apply the central limit theorem? And, and we're looking at part C that has a sample size of 50, and we have to remember that the magic number is 30. So for part B, we can't. Okay, The central limit theorem cannot be applied, but for part C, it can. Um, 50 is obviously more than 30. Now, part D wants us to understand what the shape of the distribution would be, under the central limit theorem, um, and then how it would compare if we had a sample size of 50 in part C and we increased it to 200. So first of all, the shape would be bell-shaped, okay, and it would look normal um, than the distribution then that we would be considering. Um, and if we compare the sample size of 200 to the sample size of 50 in part C, Obviously, the larger the sample size, the better. It would look more normal uh, as a distribution with a sample size of 200 compared to 50. So we would expect the shape to be bell-shaped bell in, in both instances, bell-shaped and symmetrical. But the graph that has um, a more normal sort of characteristic would be that of the higher sample size of 200. OK, we're going to move next to figuring out probabilities. Um, and so this is really where the essence of what you're going to be asked to do on worksheets, homework, quizzes, exams, or the final. Um, so the first step in this is going to be to decide whether or not you want the probability of selecting a sample. Okay, And I will point this out as we move through the conversation. And the reason I'm pointing this out now is because you're going to be confusing some of the steps that we're doing in this chapter with what we did in chapter six. Okay, And you may misuse the formula. So we have to make sure that we read carefully. The second is you're going to have to decide whether you have a proportion or a mean. Okay. 
So make sure you look at the wording of the problem very carefully. Proportions um, can be a percent, decimal, or fraction. So sometimes they're easy to spot. And means are easy to spot as well because the wording is going to mention average or it could also use the word mean. Okay, so it comes down to just making sure that we're reading carefully. So once again, um, these are the z-scores that we use. So remember for individual values, we have z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. That was chapter six. We have the standard score for sample means and the standard score for sample proportions. Um, and that deals with chapter seven. So don't forget about those. Now, what follows um, are going to be a series of eight examples, okay? The first four examples, the first numbered problems, one, two, three, and four, are going to deal with means, and problems five, six, seven, and eight are going to deal with proportions. So at this point in the video, um, I don't expect you to watch the explanation for every single one of these. I would make sure to get a flavor of them. Uh, maybe watch one or two solutions for means and one or two solutions for proportions. Okay, that's going to be the important part uh, to make sure that you understand how to do. Certainly, you could post the problem on the screen, work it, and then go to the, where the solution um, is visible on the video. So make sure you use the video uh, to your advantage. Okay, so I don't expect you to watch all eight because it is going to be a bit of a boring set of computations. The reason there are so many problems is because I work them using all the cases, area left, right, in between, and then the tails for each of the contexts. I am going to ask, however, that you do watch problem number one, parts A and B in their entirety, because there's an important comparison that we need to make. Okay, so again, use uh, the ability to watch the video, uh, do it smartly. Okay, so I'd encourage you to pause this and read what problem one and one A um, is talking about. Okay, so problem number one, we are looking at the um, cholesterol levels, okay? And so what we need to do is identify some of the key words and phrases. So one of the free words that I hone in on here immediately is the word mean. So automatically I know the context is gonna be means. And I also see this phrase, randomly selected adult, okay? I don't see a sample size anywhere. Do you guys see a sample size anywhere? I don't see where it says we've taken a sample. I see randomly selected adult. That's going to be an important distinction. I also see less than 183 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so less than, if I remember back to chapter six, means area to the left. Okay, so you see where I'm going here. This is a chapter six question. Now, you might be wondering why on earth is he putting chapter six in here? Uh, well, it's to make sure you're paying attention. This says randomly selected adult. They don't say that we took a sample. Okay, remember chapter seven is all about taking samples and figuring out probabilities. This is a chapter six question. So what we're looking for is the area that is to the left of 183. So that area is shaded in blue. This is familiar territory. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm looking for the probability that my X, X here is a um, adult, okay, uh, 20 years of age or older. And we have that the um, cholesterol level needs to be less than 183. We have a mean of 197. Um, and the standard deviation here was given to be 35. So area to the left, probability here of Z is less than negative 0 0.4. Right off the normal table, 0.3446. Okay, 0.3446. Okay, same situation um, as the previous problem, but now look at part B. Okay, there's our mean. Now look what it says. This is a randomly selected sample of 150 adults. Okay, go back and look at what part A's wording was. It said randomly selected adult. That means a single adult. Here, we're looking for a sample of 150. And again, I know it's a little hard to see, less than 183 milligrams per deciliter. You might say, we just did this already. Well, not exactly. Because now it's chapter seven. Now I'm gonna be using the Z-score x bar minus, uh, that should be mu, not mu x, not, not mu x bar, should be mu, divided by sigma over the square root of n. Okay, so probability of x bar less than 183 is equal to the probability of z is less than 183 minus 197. You might say, well, the numerator is exactly the same as last time, the part A, I'd say absolutely correct, but the denominator isn't. Now we take 35, since that's sigma, divided by the sample size of 150. So we divide by the square root of that. Look at the z-score now. It's negative 4.90, okay, which is which is an, which is a probability is practically nothing, okay, practically zero. Um, so two very, very different probabilities. So I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. First of all, I wanna point something out. Do you notice something here? That says the probability of x bar, not x, 
Okay. Also, did you notice that the denominator has changed? Okay. So there's a difference between chapter six and chapter seven. Now, someone's going to ask, why did the, the variable change to X bar in part B when we used X in part A? Part A wanted randomly selected adult. That's what X represented. What I'm looking for here is the probability that my sample mean is less than 183. So someone's going to ask, Richard, what happens if in this problem I wrote X? Are you going to mark me down points? I have to. OK, so it's very technical. You have to make sure we use X bar here. Once you do the z-score, once you start the computation of the z-score, x-bar transforms into z by central limit theorem. So hopefully that makes sense. Happy to clarify during the class. Now let's look at a comparison here. In part A, okay, we had a different probability than from part B. So it says, note how much more likely it would be to randomly select one person with a cholesterol level of less than 183. Uh, which was we found in part A, then to get a sample of 150 adults with a mean that low. So there's a definite difference between getting a um, individual that has that cholesterol level versus us collecting a sample of 150 uh, adults where everybody has a mean cholesterol level below 183. Okay. All right. Example two. So once again, uh, I'm not going to say this after after the subsequent examples, but once once I post what the problem says, feel free to pause the video and read it and give it a try. OK, so I might I might give a pause after I post the the what the uh, question is. That's to give you an opportunity to pause the video. So again, that will be the routine for the subsequent problems. OK, for this problem, um, again, we need to identify some key words. All right. Now, first of all, the wording on this one is a bit strange because it says we have a combined weight greater than the capacity of 2,000 pounds. It's posted in the elevator. So what we need to do is really rephrase this question, but strange, to say what's the probability that a random group of 10 men have a weight greater than 200 pounds? And the 200 is coming from the sample mean here. Okay, we have 10 guys getting into the elevator. Capacity is 2,000. So that on average should be about 200 pounds uh, per individual. Okay, so we have a group of 10 men. That's our sample size. We have weight greater than, greater than means area to the right, okay? And we have, again, our mean. So I know I'm dealing with mean, so chapter seven. Now, there is a note that we do have a small sample size here, okay? However, there is a phrase that was used. Did you all notice it? It says normally distributed. So because we know that the weights of U.S. men from prior knowledge are normally distributed, the sample size being small can be overlooked. OK, and that's because the population we're looking at is normally distributed. So when we have information about the population, we are very happy. OK, so this is the exception to that, that small sample size. We know something about the population. So once again, this is what we're dealing with in Chapter 7 with mean. So there's our z-score formula to remind us. So we have the probability here that x bar is greater than 200. So we take that 200, we subtract the mean. We divide by sigma, which is 32, divided by our sample size of 10. So we have our probability that z is greater than 0.52. So remember, that's area to the right. Um, how do you deal with area to the right? As a quick refresher, you can look up 0.52 and subtract that area from 1. Or you can look up the uh, z-score of negative 0.52. Either way you spin it, um, we get 0.3015. So a lot of this, again, familiar territory from chapter six, really after we compute what the z-score is. All right, this question dealing with women's athletic shoes. Um, again, I see the word mean, okay? I see random sample of 50. And look at this phrase, differ from the population mean by less than five bucks. I hope you remember what that means, okay? It's definitely a chapter seven question, means sample size of 50, and this is area in between. So if you forgot differs from the population mean by less than five bucks, you need to get back to chapter six video. I have a really nice explanation 
of how that works. So it's area in between. So what we're looking for here is the probability that my X bar is locked between $70.15 and $80.15. How did I get those two values? Well, the difference we said was five buck. So you need to add $5 to the $75.15 and subtract it. Okay, that's from the mean. So that's how I obtained those boundary numbers. The good news here is that the z-scores turned out to be opposite, okay, after we do the computation with the standard deviation and sample size of 50. And area in between here, we look up the z-score for 1.98, get that area, look up the area to the left of negative 1.98, and subtract the two. And what we end up with is 0.9522. Again, hopefully familiar territory from chapter six. All right, this particular problem, again, I see the word mean floating around in the problem. I see batch of 50 screws, noting our, noting our sample size. And this one says differs from the population mean by more than. So the last problem was differs by less than, which meant area in between. This one is area in the tails. And again, chapter seven, dealing with means and a sample size. So what we do is we take 1.625, we add and subtract the 0 0.004, that gives us our boundaries of 1.621, 1.629. Um, again, we're dealing with X bar sample mean, so we're looking at two separate probabilities, one for less and one for more. So the z-scores here are negative 2.83 and positive 2.83, okay? Since they're opposites, I can simply look up the area to the left of negative 2.83 and multiply by 2. And that gives us 0 0.0046. All right, so these were the questions that involved means. Um, what we're going to look at next are the questions that involve um, proportions. Now, there's a little box here. I want to just again remind you of vocabulary um, because we can test these kinds of things on exams and finals. So if somebody asked you for this particular question, what is the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means in this question? We would respond 1.625 because that's the value that we used as the mean. And okay? that's what was reported to us. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution for sample means would be what our denominator is in the z-score formula namely the 0 0.01 divided by the square root of 50, okay? And that comes out to be a value of 0 0.00141. So again, don't be weirded out if you see this vocabulary come up in questions like this, okay? So what's the mean? What did we use as the center? That's 1.625. And what did you use for the standard deviation? That's sigma over the square root of n. Okay, this question, um, you should notice we got percentages floating around, okay? We also have at least 68% as a key phrase, at least means greater than, and I see random sample of 100 voters. So definitely chapter seven, but this time dealing with proportions. And this is area to the right. You have to remember that phrase at least means more than 0.68. Okay, so in this instance, we don't use X bar anymore because the, the context has changed to proportion. So now we want the probability that P hat is more than 0 0.68. Okay, so look what happens with the formula. So the numerator is 0 0.68 minus 0 0.79. 0 0.79 is our um, E, our parameter. And we divide by 0 0.79 times 1 minus 0 0.79 divided by 100. So we have to take the square root of that entire quantity. Make sure when you're doing the computations for this, you're doing them slowly. These are a bit tricky. OK, now by the, by the looks of the graph, remember drawing the picture is always very helpful. Um, that is a huge area, right? What's shaded in blue is what I'm looking for. So I'm expecting that, that probability to be quite large. So it turns out that the z-score here is negative 2.70. We want the area to the right. We've talked about how to do that. The answer we get is 0.9965. So practically the entire curve is shaded in, and that's very evident um, from the picture. Problem six, okay, so again, we have percentages floating around. I see random sample, so suggesting to me chapter seven again, and now we have the phrase no more than 80 of the voters, okay? So 
definitely a chapter seven question dealing with proportions, no more than means uh, area to the left. Now there's something rather curious about this one. They don't tell us what P hat is. Did you see that? It says, what is the probability that in a random sample of 100 voters from the precinct, no more than 80 of the voters would be registered Democrats? So you actually have to build what P hat is. So that would be 80 of the 100 in the sample being registered Democrats. So that would be 80% or 0 0.8. So sometimes you might have to build the uh, sometimes the sample mean, sometimes the sample proportion, okay? And there would be information provided to you. In this case, they didn't tell us explicitly what P hat was, but they gave us the information to figure it out. So in this case, we want P hat to be less than 0 0.80. So that means area to the left. We put in what we know. So P hat again is 0.8. Um, the, the parameter here, uh, population uh, proportion 0.81. Put that into the appropriate uh, denominator divide by uh, the 100, which is the sample size, and we end up with a um, value that should be, that should say Z, not P hat. Z is less than uh, negative 0 0.25, okay? And that would be a probability of 0 0.4013. Uh, looks pretty good because if you notice the blue area, it's almost half, okay? So yes, that makes sense. This should be 0 0.4013. Okay, this one, we again notice we have percentages. I see random sample and look at that phrase again, differs from the population proportion by less than 1%. That's area in between, okay? So here we go again with that phrase. So definitely chapter seven with proportions area in between. Okay, so how do we get the boundary numbers? So this one's a little tricky, 8.3%, you gotta move the decimal two places to the left. Why two places? Because that's what percent means. Percent means hundredths. So that would be 0 0.083. You can see it in the square root, okay? That's our parameter. So as a result, you have to then add and subtract 0 0.01 to that number. So that's how we got 0 0.073 and 0 0.093, okay? Now, some people are wondering why is the numerator negative 0 0.01 on the left and 0 0.01 on the right? Because that's the difference. They actually told us what the difference is between the boundary number and the mean, the mean here being the 8.3%. Okay, so that's what those values are. Um, so the z-scores end up being 0.3, negative 0 0.31 and positive 0 0.31. You can see it's a pretty narrow area. Okay, and so it seems to make sense that uh, the, the total area of the percentage would be 0.2434. Um, as our final answer. So very tricky, again, with the computations, do make sure that you take your time, uh, and especially with the substitutions that you're using p in the square root and not p hat, okay, is important. All right, so once again, 8.3% uh, is a proportion. We've got a random sample floating there. I see differs from the population mean by more than 2%. That again is area in the tails. We've seen that phrase already. Okay, and here is our um, worked solution. So again, how did I get the 0 0.063 and the 0 0.103? Take the 8.3% of 0 0.083 and add and subtract 0 0.02. That gives us our boundary numbers. So our final answer here should be 0 0.4902. And you'll notice that I did find the Z, um, area for one of the z-scores and multiplied by two. And that's because we have symmetry working on our side here. Now, just like in one of the examples that I did with means, I do want to remind you of what the mean of the sampling distribution of sample proportions is. And so in other words, that question is asking you, who are you using as the center for this distribution? And the answer is the 8.3%, the 0 0.083. And if somebody asks you what's the standard deviation that you're using for the sampling distribution of sample proportions, and your answer is, well, whatever's in the denominator, that came out to um, 0 0.02892, okay, uh, the result of that square root. So again, just showing you that vocabulary. All right, so what have we accomplished in this section? Quite a bit, working through eight examples. Um, again, I hope the explanations were, were sufficient for you. Happy to answer any additional questions um, that you may have in the class. But certainly we've 
looked at how the central limit theorem um, applies to cases that involve means and proportions with the samples. We've identified the features of the sampling distribution and worked, um, not several, but eight examples with probability in the context of means and proportions and examining the cases of area to the left, area to the right, in between, and in the tails.